this ever happened to you where you have to deliver a message to someone? Maybe it's a tough message, family member, work colleague, maybe it's a bit of feedback. And you think about the words, you think about what you know of them, you think about your relationship with them, you put quite a bit of effort into this, you say what you have to say, and either in the moment or sometime post that moment, you realize that they completely misunderstood what you said. That must have happened, right? How many of you then kind of say to yourself immediately, what the fork just happened, right? I mean, how could that have happened? I put so much energy into this, I thought about my words, put a lot of effort into it. How is it that my message got so uh, misunderstood? Some of you might even come to a conclusion that either I'm an idiot or they're an idiot, right? Most of you probably think that they're an idiot because you've put some effort into this. I mean, when we put effort into anything, we expect some kind of a return, and often in communication, this doesn't happen. You might even go a bit farther, and you might think about you know, the role that personality and temperament plays in this, and you might do a Myers-Briggs or one of those other multicolored personality tests. You might get to understand your own personality a lot better, apply that knowledge to the other person that you want to deliver the message to, think about the words, think about the context, put all this energy and effort and research into it, deliver your message, and you have exactly the same result. And this can be quite disappointing, and I'm sure this has happened to many of you. Now, in that case, you're left with only one conclusion. They are definitely the idiots, right? <laughs> and there's no way that you are the idiot in this situation when you've put that much effort and research into it. And this is kind of largely, broadly speaking, a little bit of a sense of the way we think about uh, our communication and we think about our exchanges with other people when they don't quite go the way we had expected. And I think this is obviously a very simplistic conclusion, but this dynamic causes a lot of tension in the world today. So I think there's actually another reason, a more profound reason why we have these communication challenges. And I think it's because of a choice that we have made as humans and it's a choice that we are continuing to make today. And that's fundamentally around this concept or paradigm of communication around the spoken word and the written word. I think this mode of communication, and I sometimes refer to it as a technology choice, and I'll explain that a little bit later, but this choice has fundamentally limited how we interact emotionally. So think about the spoken word and the written word. It's done great things for humanity, raised us to the apex on this planet. It's a great way to share knowledge, very efficient at sharing knowledge, but it's extremely poor and limited at how you transfer emotion. I want to give you two very basic, very simple examples just to kind of set the scene here a little bit. If you look at these pictures of couples getting married, I might ask you how it makes you feel. Some people might say it makes me feel happy because it reminds me of my wedding day. Some people might, might say it makes me feel sad because that person is no longer with me. But just think about that. Does, do those words and does that simplistic expression even come close to the depths of the emotion that you feel when you think about these things? Not even close. Here's another very basic example. We're all on the beach tomorrow morning, which I hope we will be, in Bermuda, looking at the sunrise. We in, uh, sense the increase in temperature, changes of color, reflection off the water, animals start waking up, making sounds. You try and describe that, try and describe how that experience makes you feel. I think it's almost impossible, if not impossible, to do that with the way we currently communicate through the spoken word and the written word. Now, some people argue with me and say, oh, well, there's great poets that can convey emotion. And yes, there are, but in my view, they convey a limited amount of motion, emotion to a limited number of people in a very limited way. That is not something that speaks to the masses. Not, and very few of us in this room are probably reading poetry every day. Or maybe you're far more sophisticated and educated than I am. Uh, but I know most people that I know aren't engaged in literature in that way. So if we think about this for a little bit, why is this the case? Just think about the way we communicate. We have this vastly complex a entity that is the human, with our consciousness, as complicated as it is, it's multidimensional, non-linear, extremely complex, and look what we've done. We've broken that down to something that's one-dimensional, very simplistic, and a very linear approach to how we communicate. And with this simplification, which of course has been necessary, and there's reasons, and I won't go into the evolution of that, but there's reasons why we communicate this way, and it's done us very well from a human perspective. But through that simplification, I believe we've lost a lot of that which makes us most human. And we've simplified out the complexity and we've simplified out the emotion. And I think this is something we need to be extremely aware of. And I talked about a choice or a technology choice. 
We might not have had much choice in our earlier days in human evolution, but surely we have a choice now with the level of education that we have in the world and our ability to manipulate the world and technology around us. So if you're with me a little bit on that, if you even think that's an interesting question, if you believe my premise that this mode of communication is fundamentally emotionally limited, let's look at where things are today and the way we communicate with modern technology. So we've taken something that's already quite limited in its ability to convey emotion, and we've distilled it down to 140 characters of text and emojis. Now, do you think that a happy face represents the complexity of your emotion or the complexity of you as a human being? I very much doubt so. Now, don't get me wrong, I love texting, I text a lot. I love technology in general. I know why we use this technology. It's exceptionally convenient. And actually, when I think about technology, I think about most technology that we accept as humans is technology that adds to our convenience quite substantially. But the problem with that convenience is often with convenience comes a decoupling or a distraction from that which makes us most human. And I think this is something we need to think about a lot more from a technology perspective and from a human consumer perspective. You know, we've, technology has do, done a great job connecting humanity, but now I believe it's the time that technology connects us back to our humanity. So I'd ask you to think about this, the way you communicate and the way you use this kind of modern technology, albeit immensely convenient, but just think about how it's actually moving you maybe farther away from that which most makes you human. So now let's think to the future. Let's think about the emerging technologies that you've all heard of, augmented reality, virtual reality, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and of course everyone is on about robots all the time as well. We throw that in there. Now if you think about the way this technology is developed today, and if you think about the mindset of the engineers and scientists and the technology and the technologists that developed this, and if we extrapolate out from today to the future with those technologies, it's my belief that this is our near-term future existence. It's what I call becoming a digital zombie, okay? I mean, you laugh, but it's actually really worrying to me that I genuinely believe this is a highly likely, uh, highly probable that we will have to engage the world this way in the next five years. You're gonna become this digital zombie isolated in your own virtual existence, completely removed and decoupled from other humans and from your humanity. And I really think long and hard and I worry about the future of humanity with this continuous movement of technology moving us away from our humanity. Now, I'm an engineer and I work with a lot of engineers and scientists and you know, we've gone through our college training and we do the things we do in work. And I can tell you the vast majority, if not most of the engineers I um, work with and I know in general across any discipline, they will just develop technology such that this is the output. We're kind of working on how do you optimize transmitting zeros and ones across the air over wireless through the fiber optic cables and so on and so forth. And we develop these different technologies, VR, machine learning, AI, and don't really think about the consequences that that technology has on humanity and on our humanity. So this is something I'd like to kind of share with you, a little bit of um, perspective that I've gained uh, recently in the last few years. I'm an engineer. This is what I studied at university. It was uh, aeronautical engineering, and my passion was aerodynamics and fluid dynamics. And of course, there's deep rational thinking and deep analytical thinking, and there's immense value in that uh, in the STEM subjects and in engineering and science. And the world has become a better place because of the evolution of technology, because of some of these ways of solving problems and thinking about the world. But when I was getting more involved and more into the engineering and science and thinking about the role that I should play and the work I was doing should play in humanity, I realized that, in fact, this way of thinking is very limited in some ways, yet very powerful in other ways. And recently, I lead this organization where we collaborate very intensely and purposefully with the artistic world, bringing artists in to work deeply with our engineers and our scientists to give a different perspective. And I'd like to share with you my perspective on the difference between an engineer, scientist, a technologist, and an artist to give you a sense where the tensions are and where some values can be brought out of this. So for example, in my view, and I'm painting a broad picture, some people after this talk are gonna argue with me and say, hey, you misrepresented me, I'm actually not in that bucket. But for the most part, in the engineering science fields, this is a very good description in my view and my experience of how an engineer and a scientist thinks. So they start with a big problem of a certain size, break it down into its smaller, sizable chunks, work on that intensely and almost forget about anything else aside from that problem um, while they're solving it. And they do this in a very reductionist, linear, logical way. And an engineer can tell you how I go from A to D by passing through B and C. 
as a simple example. Now, if you look at the artist, artists and the creatives out there in the world, they go about things in almost exactly the opposite way. They start with a very tiny idea that can become a universe of possibility in its own right. And they go about this in an expansionist, divergent, non-linear, illogical way, logical from the perspective of an engineer for sure. And the interesting thing is, even the way I've drawn this, you can see that they're almost exact opposites. And they, these, this opposition causes immense tension between these two worlds. And it can be very difficult to bring these two worlds together because of the different ways of communicating, the different ways of seeing the world, different um, philosophical notions. But what I've discovered in this role, running this organization where we collaborate deeply with the artistic community, is that if you can overcome some of those initial barriers, and if you can have a purpose-driven, vision-led organization, you can achieve great things. That the summation of both of these two things that are typically opposite can drive great value, and potentially great value for all of humanity. So it's at this intersection that excites me most. And I genuinely believe that the future of humanity lies at this intersection, especially with respect to fusing art and technology and how that might benefit us, broadly speaking, but also reconnect us to our humanity. So what I'd like to do is just give some examples of the work we've been doing with our artistic collaborators to give you a sense from an engineering perspective, from a technology perspective, how it can completely change your view of the world and how it can open up your mind to entirely new ways of thinking and developing technology. So earlier I talked a little bit about how this mode of communication, the spoken word and the written word, I believe is fundamentally limited with respect to emotion sharing. Now, there, is other, there are other ways of communicating. One other language of communication, in a way, is music. And music is naturally an extremely good way of conveying emotion. No matter what the music is, no matter what music you listen to, whether it's contemporary, classical, hip-hop, jazz, it doesn't matter, you can get a sense of deep emotional transfer through that music. There's not much knowledge shared, there's not much context, but there's an emotion exchange. And I'll just give you a very brief sample, I'm going to play a piece, one of my favorite pieces of music by Elgar, and just in a few notes you'll already kind of get an emotional response. So you get the idea. And I think most of you would agree, no matter what music you listen to, there is this emotional reaction. So that's a language of emotion sharing already there that's deeply connected to human existence, how we perceive sound and music. So we work with composers and musicians to understand how emotion is transferred in music. We work with neuroscientists to understand how the brain discerns those patterns. And we're also developing technology such that we'll be able to transfer those emotions between people. Now, with all of my discussion about the limitations of the spoken word and the written word, I'm not saying that we should drop that mode of communication, but I believe that we should augment it with an emotional overlay, because I think it's too emotionally limited. So if you look here at the diagram, you can see that the spoken word and the written word are very strong from a knowledge transfer perspective, very strong, very strong context laden, but they're emotionally weak, and music is exactly the opposite. So what we're working on with our artistic collaborators in, in just one project is to bring these two together so we take the best of both those modes of communication and hopefully share and transfer emotions between people and thereby break down some of these barriers that exist today all around the world. So to, to give you a little bit of a more detailed uh, example of it, specifically on this topic, what we're doing, we're looking to develop technology that will involve and leverage the concept of neuroplasticity where we can send you information using a different sensory input, such that your brain will perceive the emotions in that different in sensory input, and then make sense of that emotionally. So what I mean by that is I can send you a text message which has some simple text, an emoji, but embedded in that text message is a vibrational response, we call this haptics, using the motors on the phone, and contained within that vibrational response will be the emotional complexity of how you might listen to music. So we're not saying you go around the world singing to each other and listening to musical chimes, although that might be fun. Maybe the world would be a better place if we all did that. But we can send you that emotionally complex information through a different sensory input. What I mean by that is instead of oversaturating the eyes and the ears like we do in our modern existence, why don't we use our touch to send you different information? That's one example that we're developing as a technology company that we never would have even thought about in this way, only for our deep interactions and relationship with the artistic community. 
I'll give you a couple of other um, high-level examples just to give you a, a deeper sense of why I'm so passionate and believe that the fusion of art and technology is a really strong way for us to better humanity in general. So there's an artist there called Jeff Thompson, and in the picture, if you can pick out the robotic arm, that's some of the work he's done. He pointed out to me that we spend an order of magnitude more time on our smartphones than we do with the person you most love in your life. Okay, think about that, right? You, you go into your app and you actually look at how much time you're spending on your phone and you think about how much sp time you spent with the person you love the most on this planet and it's an order of magnitude more time on your phone than that with, with that person. Now, straight away, that's just kind of depressing, right? And that made us think about entirely new communication devices that would be much more intuitive, much more connected to our humanity, such that we wouldn't have to be on our smartphones engaging our thumbs like this all the time. Another artist there, Su Gwen Chung, she's very well known and an expert in collaborating with robot, robots, and she does drawing collaborations with robots, robot arms and robot swarms. And with Su Gwen, we learned through our collaboration that if you take the best of humanity with the best of um, technology and you pair them together, the combination of that can be far better than either on their own. And we learned that it shouldn't be an either or question. It shouldn't be humanity or te technology. It can be both combined in very powerful ways. And through this collaboration with Sue Gwen, we learned about new ways to visualize data, new, new ways to analyze data, new ways to discern complexity and how humans interact with complex systems like smart cities. And this is very exciting for us. It opened up whole new ways for us to think about our technology and connect it to humanity. And the final example I gave is uh, a work we've done with Harry Yeff, AKA Reaps One, who you're gonna see in the very next talk. And with Harry, we were exploring the creative potential of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So both of us are really, we get very upset and frustrated with the negative discourse in the popular media around artificial intelligence. Most, most of you, if you're not in that world, you probably read the articles and you're quite fearful. We think that artificial intelligence has this immense capacity to increase the creativity of all humanity. And you'll see in the next talk some of the work we've done with Harry, where we've shown that we can take the human capacity for creativity to whole new levels by interacting in compelling ways with these systems. So with that, I'd like to just conclude by kind of just posing some questions to you. I'd ask you to think about deeply how we communicate, this mode of communication, the written word and the spoken word. Think about its limitations. Think about how you consume technology, both you as a human, as a consumer, and any of you that work in tech, how you develop technology, and is it good for humanity or bad for humanity, either today or in the next 20 or 100 years. And also think about the next time that you're having a conversation with someone and it doesn't go quite the way you expected. Maybe think about the fact that they're possibly not an idiot and it's a problem of this fundamental limitation of the way we communicate. Thank you.